Greetings from Michigan State University and welcome to EAB University's 2017 Spring Webinar Series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. This is Robin Osborne coming to you from Michigan State University and along with my EAB University colleagues, Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University and Amy Stone from The Ohio State University, we welcome you to today's webinar Hemlock Woolly Adelgid in Michigan, being presented to us by John Bedford of the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, or MDARD for short. John began his career with the MDARD's Pesticide and Plant Pest Management Division in 2003 as the EAB Regional Survey Supervisor and is currently the, the department's Pest Response Program Specialist. His duties include implementing pest response program activities, facilitating forest pest surveys, and providing outreach and education related to forest invasive species. John graduated from Michigan Technological University with a bachelor's in forestry and has accrued 25 years of experience working in the green industry prior to beginning work at MDARD. Before we get started, please know that we welcome your comments and questions, so please feel free to type them in the chat feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally the top of your screen. We will make a note of all the questions and we'll have John respond to them when his presentation is finished. To keep these free webinars coming, we need your feedback. After the webinar, I will be emailing a link to a short voluntary confidential survey that I hope you'll take the time to fill out. If you're one of the first 10 people to fill out the survey, we will be sending you an EAB goodie bag. For those of you wanting CEUs, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, complete the survey and send an email message to amystone at stone.91 at osu.edu. Certificates will be mailed to you within a week of today's program. I will also send this information to you when I send out the email after the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing soon at www.emeraldashbor.info. You will also find the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today, and John, please unmute your microphone, share your screen with your presentation, and we'll get started. Can you hear me, Robin? Yes. Okay, I'm just looking to share my screen here, and we should be able to get going. All right, see my screen? Yes. Okay, very That's good. good. All right. Um, first of all, um, I just wanted to say hello to everybody. And I wanted to um, thank uh, Robin and Cliff and Amy uh, for inviting me to uh, do this presentation. Um, this is a, a extremely critical issue for us in Michigan currently. And I um, appreciate the opportunity to be able to share um, this information. Um, let's see. I'm having trouble advancing my slide there we go all right so um yeah appreciate the opportunity to present this on emerald ash border university i've been a, a listener uh, to many of these webinars in the past and have a great appreciation for the information that's being um, presented and then compiled and archived for folks to go in and, and look at later so um, <clears throat> i have a lot of information in my presentation today do remember that if i do go quickly through some things that it is being recorded and you'll be able to go back and look at it um, Again, if I go through anything uh, quicker than you wanted me to. It's a, a big story to try to tell in one hour. Um, some of the things that I'd like to cover today were just some background on hemlock in Michigan, uh, a little bit of a hemlock ID, uh, what is hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, what are the signs and symptoms, the life cycle. Um, Lookalikes become a very important issue when it comes to um, asking people to go out and look for it and report it. So we'll go through some common lookalikes um, talk about survey, how, how we can go look for it, um, how it's dispersed, a little bit about the history of hemlock woolly adelgid in the U.S. and in Michigan, um, go through what our current situation is for hemlock woolly adelgid in Michigan, touch on the treatments that are available, talk about some best management practices, touch briefly on biocontrol, uh, 
describe a couple of things that are going on with quarantines, um, go through a list of what we're putting together as our um, primary uh, response, response strategies elements, give you some resources, tell you how to report if you find it, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. Uh, this slide is my basic stock slide for any forest pest uh, presentation that I do. It's important to begin to describe early in these presentations all the different impacts that could be um, that could happen as a result of different forest pests getting in and uh, beginning to damage our resource. Um, the costs associated with tree removal and replacement. A lot of these most people are familiar with because of emerald ash borer. Uh, creates some ecological damage and that's a particular concern with hemlock woolly adelgid. Reduction in property values in cases where people are using these for landscape uh, plants. Um, although hemlock's not a big timber species in Michigan, um, there, there ultimately will be some lost timber value if a hemlock woolly adelgid has its way. Um, lose the aesthetic value, that's a very key thing uh, when it comes to our recreation areas and the like. Hemlock is uh, present in a lot of our high value recreation areas and uh, loss of that could definitely impact the aesthetics of those areas, and therefore impact tourism. Uh, people might not be inclined as much to come to a park that's full of dead hemlock as they would be otherwise. And then there's all the other effects on utilities and other industries, and in Michigan particularly, our, our growers, those that produce and sell hemlock in Michigan are gonna have some impacts related to um, hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, first, I kind of wanted to just advertise this. Um, it's, uh, it's new within the last year or so. Um, it's an invasive species website that uh, Michigan has developed. In the past, it used to be the case where the Department of Environmental Quality, Michigan Department of Agriculture, and our department would, all had invasive species information on their separate websites. And this is a um, initiative that began, like I said, a couple years ago to try to compile all that information into one spot. I would encourage you to visit this website. There is a lot of information available in here and, um, and it is constantly being upgraded and maintained. So don't just visit once, come back and visit a couple of times. All right, hemlock. Um, we have about 170 million hemlocks growing in Michigan forests. Um, and then we have thousands more of hemlock that have been planted into our landscapes. It's abundant in both the northern lower peninsula and the upper peninsula, although it can occur almost anywhere, um, in pockets especially. Um, and then the uh, other issue we have here in Michigan is much of our hemlock resource is um, relatively old trees. Um, there's not a lot of regeneration occurring out in the, in, in the forest, and a lot of that's because of the intense browsing by deer uh, that happens. They'll eat, eat a hemlock uh, off the forest floor as soon as it gets about three needles on it and then uh, and it's gone. Um, it's a very shade tolerant plant and that's important um, in, a, in a lot of respects. Um, it gets used in a lot of landscape situations where there's over overstory trees and about the only choice that people have for uh, planting an evergreen for screening purposes or something like that would be a hemlock because it's the only thing that's going to really do well in the shade. Um, it becomes a very important resource for wildlife, winter cover, um, There's uh, provides uh, food and other habitat for birds and, and mammals. Um, if we lose hemlock in Michigan, we'll suffer some of the same effects that they've been suffering out east where this has been a problem since the 50s. Uh, where it can start to alter soil temperatures, nitrogen cycling, de decomposition rates, start to impact the overall structure of the forest. And then of concern in Michigan, since we're so attached to our water, um, is uh, it could increase uh, erosion uh, through loss of these trees, reduce the water quality, uh, increase water temperatures, and changing the um, uh, communities of aquatic organisms. A lot of times when I relate this uh, issue to people, I talk about our cold water trout streams that are very important to Michigan and tourism, and um, hemlock tends to grow along. A lot of these trout streams shades those streams, keeps the water temperatures cool, and improves the fisheries. Um, I'm a trout fisherman myself, and I would be very dismayed if um, we were to lose all the hemlock and therefore change the quality of our, our stream trout streams in Michigan. Um, hemlock is pretty easy to identify. Once you've seen it, you pretty much got it. Um, there's not a lot you can confuse it with. Uh, needles are very short in comparison to, um, uh, you know, say, balsam fir. 
um, or U, some of the other ones that you might confuse them with. Um, they're flattened um, and they have a, they have a spiral. Um, they don't have a spiral arrangement on the twig like uh, spruce does. The cones are very small um, and um, once you see the bark on large trees, it's very distinctive, distinctive and it helps you identify those. So I won't spend a lot of time on that, but if you do want more information about hemlock um, identification, um, I'm going to point you to the website uh, address at the bottom of the page, um, michigan.gov slash hwa. That is where we are currently housing all of our information about hemlock woolly adelgid, not just the identification information. So I encourage you to um, visit that web page again, not just once, but on a frequent basis because there's continually, uh, we're continually adding new information uh, to that web that web page. <clears throat> so one of the first things that we look at when we run into one of these situations is where is hemlock? What's the threat? Uh, where do we need to start looking for it? And so uh, there are maps being developed. Um, there's still a lot of work to do in this area to figure out where host material is. Um, this map, um, it's got a couple of things of note on it. One is you'll see that there's hardly any green on the lower half of the lower peninsula. And that does not mean that there's no hemlock there. It just means that there's not a lot of good information out there currently to tell us where hemlock is in those areas. And then also the urban hemlock is, is very uh, difficult to, um, to track and map. The other notable thing on this map is the red oval on the left side of the lower peninsula. That currently kind of outlines the area where we have in current infestations of hemlock polyadelgy. So what is it? It's an insect that um, as an adult pierces its host and sucks out the nutrients. So it takes the water and the, and the nutrients out of the tree. And another thing it does is the feeding on eastern hemlock induces a kind of a hypersensitive response. And that hypersensitive response starts to reduce the efficiency of the vascular system of the plant. And a lot of times that in combination with the, the loss of fluids from the tree is what kills the tree. It's another um, friend from Asia. Um, it was first discovered in the western states back in the 1920s. Um, it does not tend to be a big problem out in the western states because they are, uh, it's attacking western hemlock as opposed to eastern hemlock. And the thought is that the western hemlocks, um, that it, hypersensitive response is not induced on uh, western hemlocks as a result of hemlock woolly adelgid feeding. And there are also some predators present out there that tend to keep the populations in check. Um, it was first discovered um, out in the eastern states in Virginia in the early 1950s. And now we're talking about it attacking eastern hemlock um, that do not fare very well uh, when they're infested with hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, lives off the twigs. Um, as the tree becomes high and more infested, the needles start to turn a grayish green. The tree stops producing buds. The needles will drop. You get into a low vigor situation, which may lead the tree susceptible to secondary infestations. And tree, heavily infested trees um, can die in as little as four years. Most people say it takes about four to 10 years for hemlock woolly adelgid to kill uh, a hemlock tree. Um, the picture on the right there of the tree, that's not taken in Michigan, but unfortunately we do have hemlock that are in that bad of shape or worse in certain sites um, in Michigan where we have infestations currently. I am not going to spend a whole lot of time on the life cycle. I'm more of an operations and a regulatory person than I am a, than I am a scientist or a researcher, um, but I'll briefly go through this. There's two generations a year. Um, all the insects are female, um, so there's no mating required. So one individual move to a new area can start an infestation. Um, so right now, the stage that they're at out there is the um, nymphs are feeding and developing and then in a couple of weeks here especially if the weather stays warm those um, cisterns are going to mature and lay eggs the eggs hatch they very quickly um, begin feeding and mature any of the winged adults that are uh, produced they're going to fly off and die um, they're looking for spruce but they it just doesn't work on on our spruce. Over in Asia, there's a, a life stage that attacks spruce, but 
we're not going to talk about that. It doesn't happen here in North America. They'll lay eggs. Those eggs will hatch. The, the nymphs will lay dormant for almost all summer. And then it's late summer, usually September, October, they attach to the tree and begin feeding. And then unusual for an insect, they do a majority of their feeding during the winter time. And then, um, then we're back around where we started at. So if you want more information about um, the life cycle, I'm gonna point you towards this publication, very well done by Deb McCullough from Michigan State University. It's a six page um, overview of hemlock woolly adelgid. And she's done a really good job of putting a lot of information in six pages. So I would encourage you to go to that website that I mentioned earlier and take a look at that. Just a couple of pictures um, that I think are interesting. Most of these are the black and white ones are electron scanning microscope pictures, and it kind of gives you an idea of how small these things are. If you need an electronic scanning microscope to look at these, they're pretty darn small. Um, the picture on the right that's got the red circle around the um, the first instar, um, that's pretty small, but you can see that with a hand lens if you're out looking um, during the summer. That's what you're going to find out there. The um, uh, one thing I always like to point out is the picture at the top where the red arrows are, the, the arrow itself is pointing towards the insect. And then the arrow heads that you see below it are actually pointing to the, um, the stylet, the mouth part, the feeding part of the insect. And it's amazing to me that an insect that small can throw out a stylet that long and stick it into the plant and, and feed. So what does it look like? Well, the, like I said, it's very small. It takes some microscope or hand lens to see it at a lot of life stages. But once they begin to form these woolly ovisacs, they are, they are very visible. And so there's an insect inside that ovisac, that white woolly mass um, that is feeding on the tree. Um, that white woolly mass is produced through, um, when the insect feed, it secretes this white filamentaceous material that develops into this woolly mass. Um, and that's the life stage, the, the, the stage that you're typically going to see or notice when you're out looking for this. Um, critical thing about it, and I might say it a couple times, is that it's attached to the twig, not to the needle, but to the twig at the base of the needle. If you go out there and look at these before they start their feeding, it's almost like they had a meeting and they all decided, okay, I'll take that needle, I'll take that one, I'll take that one, and they are lined up at the base of every needle going up that twig. And then as they start to feed, they start to form that woolly mass. <clears throat> I mentioned early on that lookalikes are critical uh, for us. We, we get a lot of reports of hemlock woolly adelgid, and it's, it's critical that we're able to help people sort those out uh, so we're not responding to a lot of false reports. So some of the things that are typically uh, confused with hemlock woolly adelgid and what people report to us a lot of times are things like spittle bug, um, hemlock uh, needle miner, oak skeletonizer. That was a really big one last year. Um, oak skeletonizers, they'll get on anything, screens, patio furnitures, other plants, and, and obviously on hemlock needles. But because it's on the needle and not on the twig, you should be able to sort it out that way. We've had people report to us dryer lint. Um, they think they had uh, hemlock woolly adelgid because the tree was near their dryer vent. Uh, we had uh, people report um, overspray of hydro seed mulch onto the lower limbs of hemlock as hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, mealy bugs, um, spider mite injury. It doesn't have any white or woolly look to it, but the off color um, needles um, lead people to believe that it might be a result of hemlock woolly adelgid feeding. Um, we had a lot of this this past year. Uh, the bottom one there, especially the one on the right, uh, that's beech blight aphid. Um, the hemlock was in proximity to a beech tree. They had beech blight aphid on it. For some reason, last year was a banner year for that insect, so we got a lot of reports of, of hemlock woolly adelgid when it ended up being beech blight aphid that had moved off the beach onto the, uh, onto the hemlock. Drops of pine sap. Um, I didn't stick it in here, um, just in, in uh, consideration of everybody, but uh, bird droppings um, can oftentimes be confused with it. And then these spider egg sacs will give people issues a lot of times as well, and, and they'll get confused. This is another one that people get confused with. This is a elongate hemlock scale. It's another non-native insect. It's not as devastating or potentially devastating as hemlock woolly adelgid can be. 
Um, but we are seeing a lot of this in the areas that we're out surveying for hemlock woolly adelgid. You'll find it either by itself on the hemlock um, or in combination with um, hemlock woolly adelgid. But the main distinguishing feature is that it's attached to the needles and not to the twigs. So it's pretty easy to sort out once you start remembering that uh, when you're out there looking. So uh, review, it a, has a wool that's attached to the twig, not the needle. Uh, once it starts to form that woolly mass, it's not going to move anywhere. It's, there's very low risk of spreading it at, this, at that point, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the mass is waxy and it's not silky or stretchy like a spider egg sac would be. Um, it's kind of wispy like a cotton ball. It's about the size of a quarter of a Q-tip tip, if you will. Um, it's not fabric like, again, like the um, uh, spider egg sacs can be. Um, there are separate balls of wool, although when they get really heavy on a tree, they can start to kind of um, conglomerate and, and become one. Um, and it doesn't look painted on like pine sap or bird droppings would. It is an insect. It is very difficult to detect at low levels, especially in the upper portions of the large trees. And I've got that written on the bottom of the page, but that is a key thing to remember, um, that at low levels it can be very difficult to detect. Um, we do use binoculars in some cases to try to look at the trees from the ground, but that can be very difficult. Um, the light conditions that you're dealing with that particular day can have a lot of uh, impact on your success with that method. So typically what we're doing is looking at limbs that we can see from the ground and also using a very, the longest pole pruner you can handle and reaching up into the tree and snipping off branches um, from the tree so that you can get them onto the ground and examine them there. Um, a lot of times walking through the woods, you're going to find hemlock branches on the grounds just naturally. They're uh, bro broken or chewed off. And so as we walk through the woods and we see these on the ground, we'll look at them, pick them up and look at them and, um, and see if there's hemlock woolly adelgid on them. Um, they're most evident in the late winter, early spring. Um, like I said, they do most of their feeding and development of that, that uh, woolly mass during the winter time. So they're nice and fresh come late winter, early spring. They're bright white and they're pretty easy to see. They haven't begun, they haven't begun to weather off the tree yet. Um, you can see earlier life stages, as I mentioned earlier, with a hand lens. Um, because we believe that hemlock woolly adelgid arrived in Michigan on infested nursery stock from other parts of the country, either prior to or in violation of our quarantine, it's important that um, hemlock near areas where hemlock has been planted be um, an initial focus of all survey efforts. So um, it's probably going to show up near landscaped areas first, um, rather than out in the middle of a woodlot. Uh, where nothing's been planted. Um, and then there's also some folks that believe that uh, surveying around bird feeder locations may, may be productive. Uh, birds are very active in moving this insect around. And so if you're attracting birds to an area with a bird feeder and there's hemlock in that area, the, the likelihood of them introducing it um, is pretty high. And so we do focus around bird feeders if we can. Um, a lot of things going on in this slide. Um, talks about the optimum sampling period um, across the top. So anytime from late October through middle of July, when those woolly masses are most evident, um, is a good time to look. The middle of July through middle of October can be productive, but what you're going to see is either um, in stars that you need to put a hand lens on to see, or you're going to see the remnants of the woolly masses from the last uh, last generation. Um, the other thing that's important to us is to look at the period of the year when it's most likely to be spread, and that is that uh, March through um, late July period. That is the portion of the year when the insect is not firmly attached to the plant. It's either in an egg or it's an, a, a nymph or, a, or a, one of those instars that has not inserted its mouth part into the tree yet, so therefore it's not attached and it can be picked up by birds or mammals or us or anything else and moved from one place to another. So um, that becomes critical for us when we go to regulate the movement through quarantines. Um, and we, need, we look at that as a high risk period of the year or spread. Very small insect, so it can be dispersed pretty easily a number of ways. It can be blown fair distances just on the wind alone. Um, it can be moved on the fur of mammals, squirrels, deer, 
um, other types of wildlife. Um, we believe the birds in the area that we're looking at um, being infested currently are doing a good job of moving it around. Um, it gets on their feathers or feet and they move from an infested tree to a non infested tree and move the insect that way. And like I said earlier, it only takes one to start a new infestation on a tree because there's no mates required. We can move it out as people on our gear, our clothing, our equipment, our vehicles. Um, it can be moved around through the disposal of yard waste. And then, like I said, the private primary way we think it got to Michigan was on infested nursery stock. <clears throat> so this shows the uh, current situation as of the end of 2015 in the eastern part of the U.S. Um, you can see that it's impacting um, hemlock all the way from Georgia up through Maine. Um, this 2015 map is the first time that we've ever had counties in Michigan uh, denoted as being infested. Um, it says they're currently under eradication, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And um, this map is probably going to change uh, where those counties that we um, currently have is kind of pink on this map are probably going to go to the darker color. We have dealt with hemlock woolly adelgid in Michigan uh, since 2006. Um, if you look at the Emmett County site up there, we had introductions into that area. Um, we were, they were detected. Um, very, a lot of work was accomplished around those infestations uh, through tree destruction and removal, chemical treatments, and then surveying to make sure that it was no longer present. So anything you see on blue on this map are spots that we had it in the past, um, but through a lot of hard work and years of hard work, um, we were able to declare those areas eradicated. The unfortunate thing about this map is now we have a large number of red circles, and those are active sites. Those are sites where we currently have infestations of hemlock woolly adelgid. They range in size from a single property with a dozen infested trees up to some that are fairly large, and I'll describe some of those in a second. This is a kind of an, a closer up look of the current areas that we know to be infested. Um, as you see, it spans about a 75 mile long portion of that uh, Lake Michigan coast over there, all the way from south of Saugatuck to up north of uh, uh, what's over there, Shelby, up near Silver Lake State Park. Uh, the white labels indicate those that are active sites. The blue labels indicate those sites that have been um, declared eradicated over time in the past. So our typical approach and our dream approach is that we have a single infested tree, and that's the red dot in the middle. We go in and we either remove that tree or treat it. And then we treat a buffer of trees around that. Uh, because it is so hard to detect at low levels, we are not confident that just visual surveys telling us where it's at. So to be safe, we would treat all the hemlock within that 800 foot buffer area. And then we would survey out a half a mile around to make sure that there, there was nothing else that we need to be concerned about. Unfortunately, most of the sites that we're dealing with now have grown, grown way beyond that scope. This is probably the largest site that we're dealing with. It's on the north side of Lake Makatawa over by Holland. And um, if you look at the area on the right, where there's a red dot and then there's a red line that encircles some parcels that are outlined in blue, we did a tree by tree, property by property survey in that area. And we ended up with 65 properties with over 690 infested trees on them. And then we did some other survey outside of that area. And anything you see in red on that map indicates areas of infestation. So we start connecting all the dots and putting our buffers in place. And we're looking at a site that's over 610 acres uh, potentially infested. So that's one of the larger ones. This also is a large one. This is just south of Muskegon in Norton Shores. Um, the map on the left kind of shows all the buffers put together. We've got about a 345 acre site. That site has grown to the south by about a mile uh, since this map was created. And then if you look at the map on the right, in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a couple of stars. Um, those are recent detections outside the area that we were looking at previously. So that area has grown to the northeast as well. And so it's well over 345 acres at this point. So this is, those are kind of the two larger sites, but like I said, some of the smaller sites are just single trees or, um, or, 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 or a dozen trees instead of uh, hundreds of trees like those two, two large sites are. So late last year, when we started to recognize the scope of this problem, we wanted to make sure that we were informing all the property owners that we're 
living in and around these infested areas. So we started a, a communications, implemented a communications plan that involved, first of all, contacting all the licensed pesticide application businesses in those counties and the counties that surround them to let them know that we are going to be letting people know about the problem and that they might be contacted by folks that live in this area uh, to conduct treatments for hemlock woolly adelgid. We provided them with treatment information, uh, some best management practices, and then invited them to a public meeting. Then the week later, we sent out about 2,200 letters to property owners that are in and around those infested areas and provided them with the same treatment information, the best management practices, and invited to them to the meeting. meetings. We had those two meetings the first week of October. Um, over 100 people, probably about 150 people combined at the two meetings. Um, some were residents, some were um, pesticide applicators that came to learn more. Um, this map just shows the, the green counties are where we notified all the pesticide application businesses and the oval, the red oval is where the majority of the folks that uh, had infested properties or lived with in proximity to those infested properties were invited to these meetings. I can't um, fail to mention that um, a lot of our work, especially our a portion of our treatment efforts are funded um, by the USDA uh, Forest Service. We've been lucky over the years to be able to continually get funding from them to deal with hemlock woolly adelgid. And I uh, want to thank them for that, but not only for that funding, but their continued support. The good thing about hemlock woolly adelgid compared to say something like emerald ash borer when it was first discovered is there is great treatment history for this insect. Uh, because it's been out east for so long, they've been able to do a lot of the learning that we would have normally have done, had to do ourselves like we did with our emerald ash borer, um, if there'd been no history of this anywhere else in the country. Um, so these two products, dinotefuran, you might know it as Safari or Transec, um, and imidacloprid, you might know it as Mallet or Merit or, or Quali Pro. There's a bunch of different uh, ones out there. Um, these products have a great history of working very well on this insect. And um, the uh, dinotefuran works very quickly, um, can provide up to one or two years of control. Imidacloprid, not as quickly to go in, into action once it's applied, but you can get to three to five, and some people are saying up to seven years of control uh, from a single application, and it is the less expensive of the two treatment options. <clears throat> there are some, there is a major hurdle with these products, and um, it's the fact that they both have active ingredient per acre per year use restrictions on their labels, which means that you can only apply so much active ingredient in a given year. So some of these properties that we're working on um, uh, or people are going to have to work on have more hemlock than they're going to be allowed by the label to treat in a given year. So it kind of puts people into a, maybe a two or a three year treatment regime before they actually get all their hemlocks treated, unless they choose to do trunk injections because those restrictions are not on, those per acre per year use restrictions are not on trunk injected materials. Um, and because of this two or three year thing having to go on, it's real important people keep good records. And, um, and it doesn't, the active ingredient applied to the hemlock is not everything you need to count. Both these products are widely used for things like grub control on turf. So if somebody's applied those products to turf on a site, that needs to be taken into account when you're doing this calculation of the active ingredient per year per acre. Um, and then there's also some current concerns related to um, the fact that uh, both labels have language on them about the fact that either the product or degradates of the product um, are known to be found in groundwater on, in areas where water tables are high or the soils are coarse. So if you're working on those types of soil, um, you're very much encouraged to use methods other than the soil injection or the so soil drench and try to do the basal bark spray, which we'll talk about in a minute, or the trunk injections. So there's many different ways to, to apply these. One is through soil injection. Um, please don't mind these applicators and their lack of personal protective equipment. It's hard to find pictures where I'm trying to get across what I want to when everybody's dressed properly. So um, everybody should have on their long sleeves or rubber gloves and their impervious footwear. But anyway, um, so it can be soil injected with a number of different um, uh, tools. Um, and 
these both these materials can be sprayed directly on the bark of the tree and then it goes through the bark of the tree into the vascular system you can actually you can just drench it uh, dig a shallow trench around the base of the tree mix the appropriate amount of material in there and pour it on the ground around the base of the tree or you could um, do it off of a hydraulic sprayer like the gentleman is on the right although he is spraying it over mulch and you will not want to do that you want to pull the mulch back before you put the material down otherwise the mulch it'll bind up with the mulch and won't reach the, the root system um, you can do trunk injections like i mentioned there's many different ways to accomplish those trunk injections and then out east, this, this is not used a lot in Michigan yet. It might be up and coming, uh, but out east, they do a lot of uh, application using the Zimitacloprid tablets. They treat a lot of the treatments they do are often remote areas um, where it's not easy to carry in water and sprayers and all those types of things. So they can just throw a whole bunch of these in a satchel and head up off into the woods and, and treat trees that way. Um, you can do foliar sprays, um, and it might be an option for some folks. Um, they're not going to be as effective and they would need to be repeated frequently um, uh, as opposed to the soil drenches or the bark sprays um, but there are options and um, I don't know how many of you are used to spraying trees but I come from that world in the past and it spraying a tree any higher than 30 feet is pretty impractical in a lot of cases with this insect you need to get very good coverage um, on the plant otherwise you're not going to get the, the results you're looking for so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this part, but I, uh, this label, this, this per acre per year use restriction is giving a lot of people uh, some heartburn and some, it's a giddy up for them that they're trying to get over. So we're working on providing all the applicators out there with guidance and, 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 and help on how to interpret that label and how to implement these uh, applications on different properties. And so to that end, we we're providing them with, um, a great bulletin again on the left options for protecting hemlock trees from hemlock woolly adelgid and other dead mccullough from msu production um, it's, a, it's a very nice publication that goes through all the treatment options that are currently available and then <clears throat> we're also putting together um, on the right there although this one's geared for emerald ash borer it's applicable to hemlock woolly adelgid treatments because it's the same materials being talked about and it's just some guidance for how applicators should be interpreting the uh, per acre per year use limitation uh, language on the labels. This is just kind of a quick example of the situation that some folks are going to get into. Um, they have so many hemlock trees on their property that they cannot treat them all in a given year with one or even both of the products and they might be put into a, a, a two-year or a three-year cycle where they go in and they treat as many trees as they can with one product um, up to the use limit and then they treat as many trees as they can with the other product up to the use limit and then they still don't have them all done so maybe they can use horticultural oil to tie it a couple of trees over until the next year when they can come back and apply more of these materials and, all, and then ultimately over the course of two or three years they'll have um, treated all the trees with imidacloprid uh, which is important because that's the one that's going to last uh, five and maybe up to seven years. There are some mechanical and physical control methods that can be considered not as good as the chemical controls. You can, if you've got a badly infested tree, you don't have to treat it. You can just cut it down, burn it, bury it. Um, you could, on smaller trees during the period of the year, April through June, where they're not attached to the tree, just hose them down with water and wash a lot of them off to the ground. Um, or if you have heavily infested twigs or branches, you can just prune those out and, um, and destroy those. But as it's noted at the bottom there, neither of those last two practices is um, effective enough to, uh, to say that you've controlled the problem. You'll have to do something else. A lot of information on this slide, but these are some of the best management practices that we're passing along to people. Um, whenever possible, um, don't move uh, infested material off the site. So if you can deal with it on the site that it comes from, burn it, bury it, compost it, whatever, leave it where it is. Um, uh, you can drench cut stems with soapy water. You can kill them that way. Out east, they have, they have experience with uh, large piles being covered with plastic tarps and basically soil, solarizing those uh, to the point where the insects are killed and then the material can be moved off site. I mentioned the bird feeder issue. Um, we encourage people to take down or empty their bird feeders and bird baths April through June or move them at least 100 feet away from hemlock. Um, 
so that you're not encouraging birds into uh, your area during the high the time of the year where like spread is most likely. Um, we have to be careful about moving it around, like I said, on our clothes. Um, so it's important if you're working in a heavily infested area uh, to brush off, wash clothing, vehicles, and other equipment before moving on to other areas. We certainly do not ask our nursery inspectors to go out and do hemlock woolly down survey in the, in the morning and then that same day ask them to go do an inspection of a hemlock nursery in the afternoon. Um, maintain proper soil moisture. Um, and then if the trees are infested um, or thought to be infested, avoid the use of nitrogen fertilizer. If trees that have been fertilized with nitrogen and, and they're infested, the insects on those trees will produce a lot more offspring and uh, they're, they're much more happier on a tree that's been fertilized. So if you have a tree that's infested, take care of the hemlock oleodelgid first, and then if there's a need to fertilize, go ahead and do that after the pest is controlled. Um, and then treat the tree for any other pests that may be stressing it. The elongate scales, mites, loopers, gypsy moth, those types of things. Anything you can do to relieve stress on the tree is going to help it. And then we're not telling people to not plant hemlock anymore. Um, but if, if there's a plant that would serve the purpose of uh, that you were hoping the hemlock was going to serve, uh, it might be wise to substitute it, especially in these areas where we know the infestations are currently. Um, this is also available on the website. This is our best management practices or recommendations for landowners. I encourage you to go to that uh, michigan.gov slash HWA page and look for that. I said I would touch briefly on insectaries um, and biocontrol. We don't feel that we are to the point yet where we need to release biocontrol, but we believe we may be headed that direction. And so we've already gone through and uh, the exercise of establishing two hemlock hedges with uh, a third and I think a fourth one in the plan. And these would be hedges that would be used as insectaries in the future. Uh, so the hedges would be groomed, um, they would be infested with hemlock oleodelgid, we would release the biocontrol um, agents onto those infested hedges and therefore rear additional insects that could be collected and then released strategically in the areas where we want to put them to work. Um, so that's, uh, this is happening out east, there are some struggles with biocontrol. Um, winter temperatures have such an impact on not only HWA, but on the biocontrol agents themselves that uh, they've, they've had their struggles recently, particularly after the two polar vortex years in a row. Um, <clears throat> speaking of the weather, we are a little bit nervous that this winter and last winter, both being relatively mild, um, will be uh, very conducive to um, population growth of hemlock oleodelgin. And it may be the reason that we saw such an explosion of it this year uh, was the winter of 2015-16 being so mild. I mentioned quarantines earlier. We do have an exterior quarantine in place. It has been in place since 2001. It regulates the movement of hemlock and hemlock materials into Michigan. Uh, in, I'll talk about that in just a little bit more detail. Um, Interior quarantine. This is a quarantine that we're in the process of implementing and I'll talk about that a little bit more too. If you want to see information about our pest quarantines, go to um, the URL at the bottom there and that'll list all of Michigan's uh, quarantines and all the supporting information. So the external quarantine regulates hemlock materials coming in from any state that's known to be infested. So basically it bars hemlock being uh, brought to Michigan if the county it's coming from is known to be infested or if the county adjacent to the county it's coming from is known to be infested. That cannot come in under any circumstances. Um, it prevents, it prohibits the movement from the entire state of Oregon, Washington, um, and then the entire, uh, I think, Idaho and uh, the entire province of uh, British Columbia. If the materials don't originate from an infested county or a county adjacent to an infested county, they can come into Michigan, but it needs to be done under a, uh, a certain circumstances. We need to be pre-notified of those shipments, and then once those shipments arrive in Michigan, they cannot be further distributed until they've been inspected and released. Um, and it's not just hemlock 
uh, nursery stock that's regulated, but it's also all logs, branches, boughs, lumber, pallets, and uncomposted um, bark and mulch and hemlock firewood. Not that many people use hemlock for firewood. Um, so this is a little bit more about the external quarantine. Um, there has to be official surveys going on in the counties that this these materials come from, otherwise we cannot be confident that they're not infested, so that's a requirement. And, um, and uh, I think I covered most of the rest of this already. All right, so the interior quarantine. Um, we had a draft formulated, and in that draft says that we will regulate the movement of hemlock out of and within, which is kind of unusual. Uh, to do the within uh, restriction in a quarantine, but we feel it's necessary in this situation. Um, the draft went out with just Allegan, Muskegon, and Ottawa counties on it, but since the draft was made, Oceana County was determined to be infested, so that will be added to the quarantine. The regulated articles will be the same as those that are in the exterior quarantine, so nursery stock, branches, limbs, and other cut tree parts. Um, because this quarantine is going to restrict the movement out of or within the quarantine area, and that quarantine area contains a large proportion of Michigan's hemlock growers, we needed to put a process in place that would allow them to continue to do business to grow and sell hemlock. <clears throat> and so a nursery program is being developed and will be implemented here shortly. And it has a lot of criteria to it. Um, these folks that want to participate will have to be uh, sign off on a compliance agreement. They'll have to register and map all the production blocks that they want to um, have as part of this program. They need to have some staff training accomplished. Um, there's already a video that's been done by MSU and um, MSUE uh, to help these uh, tr people train their staff at these nurseries. All incoming stock has to be um, held in a separate holding area. There's going to be requirements for treatments with those pesticides that I mentioned. Um, the treatments have to be witnessed by our inspector staff to make sure they're being done properly. Um, they have to do bi-weekly um, monitoring or scouting of their hemlock during March through October. Um, the, anything that's being shipped out has to be inspected. Uh, anything detected needs to be reported to us, and then we'll be in there doing um, compliance inspections to make sure they're doing everything right. And part of those inspections will be to be looking for, uh, looking at and for records and uh, those types of things. Um, the pesticide part of that program is going to require six month um, advanced treatment with imidacloprid before they can ship out, and that one treatment would last for three years. Um, in this program. Dinotefuron, um, they can do that 15 days prior to treatment, but it's only going to be effective for one year. We've done presentations to growers last year. Uh, we reviewed and incorporated their input. Um, they finished up that training video. Uh, we've got our compliance agreement draft all ready to be used uh, by us and staff. And so we're ready to implement that program as soon as the quarantine goes into place. Um, the interior quarantine, uh, the next steps, we've, we've already informed industry, we've already done the tribal consultation, uh, we sent out the um, draft for comment to stakeholders and in industry, uh, that comment period closed at the beginning of February, so now we're at the point of incorporating comments into the final draft, we'll take that to our director for signature and we hope to have the quarantine implemented by April of 2000, of this year. And then once we mail official notice to all of the nursery license holders, the quarantine will be effective. Um, we're also working on a large overarching response strategy. And um, some of the elements of that strategy are to uh, continue to better identify where the hemlock resource is in the area of the known infestations um, and to better survey and find the full extent of those infestations. Um, treatment where feasible of invas invested in, in adjacent trees. Uh, continue with outreach and education. Outreach and education in this program has been critical. We have not been the ones to find these infestations. It has been educated, either property owners or in most cases, educated arborists who are out and about looking at trees every day that have noticed these problems and reported them to us. Without their help, we would be um, way behind on our detection program. 
And so that needs to be ongoing. We just talked about the internal and, and uh, quarantine, getting that established, and then continue to do compliance monitoring on the external quarantine. Um, there's a lot of data that's uh, produced through all these activities and uh, we need to better manage, better find ways to better collect and manage that data. Um, I forgot that I had done the click thing on this. Um, we talked about the biocontrol rearing infrastructure. Uh, there's a lot of experience uh, from out east with managing HWA I'm not really intelligent, so we are continually tapping them for their um, ideas and um, experience to uh, incorporate that into our response. Um, I mentioned that we had some sites that we had declared eradicated. You can't see me, but I'm doing air quotes when I say eradicated. Um, and prior to 2015, we, we need to go back to those sites to make sure that it actually was er eradicated through some additional survey work. There's a need for some Michigan specific research and some of that's already begun. Temperature studies, um, what does the effect of um, the proximity to the lake have on the insect? Does the lake moderate winter temperatures to the point where the survivability of hemlock oleodelgid is increased even in years where it's cold throughout the rest of the state? Those types of things. Um, Statewide monitoring and survey, we need to look in the rest of the state, not just focus all our efforts on this area where we know it to be. Um, and then continue to communicate through um, education outreach and other formal communication with our partners and stakeholders so everybody knows what's going on. And then as we move through the response, evaluate the effectiveness of it. I mentioned this page a couple of times already. Again, I encourage you to go here. There's a lot of additional information on this web page or some of the things that I've shown you in this presentation are on this web page. Um, we highly encourage people to report any instance of hemlock oleodelgid. I'm not sure if, how many of you are familiar with MISSIN, but this is one way that it can be done um, is um, using the MISSIN app on your smartphone, for instance. You can report this from the field. I like the MISSIN reporting system because it allows people to put pictures um, along with their reports. And a lot of times we can sort out what's hemolically delgid and what's not hemolically delgid just simply from those pictures. And then we also make it available by phone. You can just call our customer service center or you can send us an email at that email address. And I like the email reports for the same reason I like the missing reports um, because they can include pictures. So that's what I had. Um, I will say that most of us that work closely on this project daily um, are in agreement that we will probably never eradicate hemlock bully adelgid from Michigan uh, due to the extent that it's gotten to. Um, but it doesn't mean the situation is hopeless. There's still a lot that can be done to prevent further spread and to manage those sites that we're already aware of. So um, we're all working really hard to protect the hemlock resource in Michigan. And my email address is on there. Don't hesitate to send me an email if you have any questions. And I'm done, Robin. Well, thank you, John. That was very thorough. I mean, I learned a lot from that. I didn't didn't know some of those things. <laughs> so that's good for good review for me, because um, we have had a couple of other um, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid webinars, but that was in years past. So it's kind of nice to have this update and and refresher too as well. Um, are there questions? We are um, open for questions. You can type them either in the Q and A pod um, or in the chat pod and we can go from there. If not, if you don't have any questions now, make sure that you grab um, um, his, uh, uh, John's email address, and we will uh, make sure that he gets that. Um, he, he can get, answer your questions from there. So I think I see one here. Um, oh, nice to see the use of the Missin app. Yes, that is, a, that is also, um, a, a good resource and not, like you say not enough people know about it so um, I am not seeing any more questions so I'm not going to uh, you know belabor this too much because I know we all have other things to do so I will send John's contact information when I email everyone with the survey information and that kind of thing 
And I want to thank you, John, for all your hard work and thank you for your willingness to share all this information. And I'm sure Hamlet for Michigan, especially in Michigan and surrounding states, we're going to have our eye on this pest. And this is, this is uh, another not so fun thing. So, yeah. um, I appreciate all your work and help and doing this. And uh, I have had, I have to say, I have had a few people email me recently saying they wanted to be in on this webinar, but had other obligations. So remember everyone, we do have this being recorded. So there's, you can see this and maybe you can tell anyone that is, you know, wishes they had seen it to make sure to check the emerald-ashbore.info website on the EAB University page. And this webinar will be placed on that page probably by tomorrow. And uh, anyway, thanks, John. Oh, you're very welcome. And uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you. And everyone, um, thanks for attending the meeting. And I'm going to stop the meeting and um, enjoy the rest of your day.